one of the statements that you've said to me many times is how do you diagnose protein deficiency? It brings up a really important concept. There's immediate deficiency and then there's lifelong deficiency. Can you explain a little bit about how you think about protein deficiency? I hear people a lot of times use the nitrogen balance argument in the RDA and say, well, people don't have deficiencies. And so then I start wondering, well, what outcome are you looking for? Does it relate to heart disease or diabetes or, or cancer or uh, Alzheimer's? I mean, what does it look at? What do you relate it to? So, um, you know, we did the clinical studies looking at weight loss and we know that higher protein diets are, are very good at protecting body composition, protecting lean mass during weight loss. So in my mind, that means that the food guide pyramid, 0.8 grams is actually protein deficient because we see as true benefit of higher levels. We also know that you can substitute protein in for carbohydrates and you can reduce in insulin problems. You can, you can change diabetes. So is that a protein problem? But even simple things like osteoporosis, so bone is first and foremost a protein matrix, uh, sarcopenia, loss of muscle mass and functional mobility with aging. You know, these are these are long-term outcomes that you can't measure in a three or four or six week study. So, you know, how do you, how do you assess a deficiency? You know, unlike a, you know, scurvy where you start having gum problems in a few weeks, um, you know, protein doesn't work like that. It has much longer term effects. So uh, nitrogen balance doesn't relate to anything. And one of the markers people have been using are things like erythrocyte glutathione levels. Uh, so here we have a relationship of protein, particularly the sulfur amino acids, to one of the primary anti-inflammatory mechanisms in the body. And what we can see is that when protein gets too low down toward the RDA, those levels will go down. To maximize glutathione levels uh, in older adults, we need a minimum of 1.2 grams per kg of protein to do that. Over time, there are overt deficiencies, kwashiorkor, um, and then there are subtle deficiencies and maybe deficiencies isn't the right word that we see over time. What we don't have and what we don't see in the immediate are those individual amino acid needs and then long-term outcomes. For example, what you just said, methionine um, and glutathione production. Glutathione is a master antioxidant. It's very important. Our ability to make it seems to decrease as we get older, yet we don't say we have a methionine requirement for X, Y, and Z. I, I just wanted to, to mention that because it's important. We should do that over time. We can go through and we can talk about others. I mean, we can talk about tryptophan relative to serotonin in your mood and sleep. We could talk about threonine and gut health and the, the mucin levels. We could talk about phenylalanine and tyrosine and dopamine and cognitive function and memory. These are all amino acid roles that have nothing to do with, you know, storage or efficiency. These are amino acid metabolism roles that are significantly above the RDA. And what would happen if we don't ingest those or meet the RDA, which... We, we don't really know. And that's one of the arguments I've been making is that I frankly think our RDAs for the essential amino acids are low, but we know that if you are eating a primarily grain-based diet at the RDA, you will be deficient in two or three of the essential amino acids. And that's really what Americans do. Americans get 80% of their plant-based protein from wheat. And so wheat is a very poor quality protein. So we always have to be careful when we talk about plant-based diets or vegetarian diets to realize that when Americans shift that way, they shift toward grains. They don't shift toward eating more beans and chickpeas and, and almonds. They shift toward eating grains. I see that in, in clinic all the time at our group at Strong Medical. We see that. I do want to play 
just maybe one more segment because I, I think it's important. Americans eat more meat than anyone else in the world. It is, um, if you see these WHO World Health Organization graphics of who eats how much meat, it is the US and Canada and some European countries that eat the most. And there are countries who eat the least and they have limited access to foods. And some of those countries would benefit from more meat per person because the, really they're eating cereal. They're eating dry cereal-based foods. So his comment that Americans eat more meat than other countries, uh, all developed countries do tend to eat more higher quality protein. That seems to be a goal of you know, becoming more economically advanced. People want more protein. But in terms of comparison, uh, all of the Mediterranean countries eat more protein than we do. All of the Nordic countries eat more protein than we do. Australia eats more protein than we do. So among the developed countries, we're not particularly high in the list. And we're actually particularly low in red meat consumption. We have shifted since, you know, at this, the 70s, we shifted away from red meats toward chicken. And we eat it in a lot of ultra processed forms. So uh, meat consumption has stayed sort of constant in the US, but it's dramatically shifted from red meat to uh, chicken. Uh, and there's no evidence that that has been healthy. And in fact, what we know is that the micronutrient quality uh, iron, uh, zinc, selenium, B6, B12, uh, riboflavin have all gone down in the American diet when we made that shift. Red meats have a lot more nutrient quality than white chicken breasts. What is the relevance of essential amino acid supplementation? And I'm going to frame this up for you. A friend of mine who has been doing three-day fasts said, gee, I am fasting for three days, but I've been taking these amino acids. And I thought to myself, okay, well, then you're not actually fasting. Out there on the internet, there's a lot of amino acid supplementation. It shows on the packaging that those supplements have zero calories, even though they're complete proteins. If someone were to take that, would they essentially still be fasting? They are fasting and then they are using a amino acid supplement which is a full spectrum, complete amino acid profile. You know, on the surface level of what you just said, it highlights a real problem in our labeling laws. Uh, amino acids were never expected to be a major supplement. And so they were approved on what's referred to as the grass list, generally recognized as safe, as a supplement where people might use um, cysteine as an antioxidant or something. But now people are putting in all these essential amino acids and the, the labeling law says when amino acid is a free amino acid, you don't have to count the calories on the label. So somebody could put in 10 grams of amino acids, which would be 40 calories and say it's zero calories or worse yet, 20 grams and say it was zero calories, you know, even though it would have 80 calories in it. So your point is, they're not really fasting. You know, it, it's like saying, well, I'm fasting, but I'm taking a Gatorade or something with, with sugar in it. Uh, you know, it, it, I'm not chewing anything, but I mean, those amino acids all have calories. So that's a problem with the labeling laws. A really important point, friends, if you are taking a complete amino acid supplement in between meals, or you are taking it while you are fasting, technically you are no longer fasting. Is that fair to say? Yeah, so they just need to multiply it. Whatever grams of amino acids they're taking times four, they're taking that many calories. Mm -hmm.